Okay, so talking about the symptoms uh, of asthma, uh, these symptoms can be very variable and intermittent. So it really differs from patient to patient, and each asthmatic patient might have really slightly different uh, his own type of asthma kind of thing. So um, shortness of breath, this can be described by a patient really in many ways. So you really need to uh, take a careful history to try to elicit that out. So they might describe it as difficulty filling the lungs with air. They might describe it as inability to take um, a deep breath, like unsatisfactory breathing. And this is usually, uh, or could be due to the hyperinflation that usually happens with um, asthma, especially acute attacks. And also uh, they can describe it as just increased increase sensation or, or sensation of increased uh, work of breathing. Patient also may compl complain of uh, air hunger. Uh, they might describe it as chest tightness, um, you know, kind of similar to chest pain, but they usually describe it as a tightness rather than pain per se. And this is very helpful symptom in uh, young patients since it occurs uh, more often in association with asthma than with uh, any other uh, pulmonary or cardiac disease. So the patient, young patient describing some respiratory symptoms as just tightness uh, that should trigger you to think of asthma as a differential diagnosis. Uh, patient might uh, offer something like orthopnea, which is wor uh, worsening certain of breast uh, line flat, and this can occur in asthma-like symptoms due to GERD. And we uh, know the association between GERD and asthma. And um, symptoms generally tend to be worse at night with early morning waking. So the patient may actually tell you that they actually um, uh, wake up in the middle of the night because of the symptoms. And this also has some implications in the management as well. So it could be like something described like uh, similar to nocturnal dyspnea, uh, and uh, which as you know, uh, is a symptom also of heart failure or GERD. Um, the heart failure and GERD patient, they tend to be a little bit worse earlier at night uh, compared to the asthma, which is uh, a little bit late in the night or early in, early in the morning. But uh, always ask about nocturnal symptoms. The, the cough uh, could be uh, associated with difficulty uh, to expectorate sputum. The patient might tell you they, they feel like there is something inside, but they, can't, they cannot get it out. And remember, patients with asthma in the bath physiology, they have increased mucus production. So sometimes if they're able to get that mucus out, you know, it might be like a yellowish uh, or greenish uh, production uh, or sputum, production of yellowish or greenish sputum. Uh, and that doesn't always mean infection, so keep that in mind. And um, it might be uh, the predominant symptom, uh, especially in kids, and this is known as cough variant asthma, so you need to be aware of that. Uh, I'll talk about that uh, in another slide. And then uh, wheezing is also a very common uh, symptom, as you know, um, and it's actually maybe the only symptom that might be useful as in non-asthmatics. Uh, um, uh, as non-asthmatic, they re re rarely report the wheezing. So if a patient is in familiar with the word wheezing, is either it means they're either uh, asthmatic or they are, um, you know, have some family history of asthma. They really know what asthma is and. Um, uh, they they know someone who is close to them with, with asthma, um, but usually if it's you know patient who are really having symptoms uh, uh, persist uh, consistent with asthma and they're not known to be asthmatic and they're really describing the wheezes, this is most likely it's true it's true asthma, um, and not always but sometimes a prodromal symptoms might occur. So sometimes patient might describe something like itching under the skin or tightness between the scapulae or like in, in uh, impending doom in some patients and uh, before uh, the classic symptoms uh, of asthma actually happen. So um, physicians should make some effort to try to see if the patient has any uh, specific allergens that can be uh, triggers for the asthma or there's an association association uh, between his asthma and the uh, presence of specific allergens or atopy. So uh, you need to ask about the presence or absence of family history of asthma or, and or atopy, which supports the diagnosis of allergic asthma, which is the most common type of asthma. And, um, you know, uh, atopy can be clinically elicited by a positive skin break test. 
uh, or the presence of specific IgE antibodies in the serum against um, the most common um, uh, aero allergens. And these are probably the most common allergens that um, many of the asthma patients suffer from. So the house uh, dust mites, uh, maybe in special in developed countries, might be the most common one. And there's also uh, you know allergens in the cat and, and dog fur, and also uh, the cockroaches, especially in the inner cities, um, grass and tree pollens, and ro uh, rodents, and especially in uh, lab workers. So probably these are the kind of the most common allergens that most of the asthma patients um, suffer from. And then uh, also try to elicit if there's any history of other atopic diseases like uh, allergic rhinitis or hay fever uh, or allergic conjunctivitis and or uh, history of atopic dermatitis or eczema. Because many of the uh, patients with allergic asthma, they might have concomitant history of these diseases or family history of these diseases. And it's not uncommon that, you know, there's no specific allergens that can uh, be found. So um, this is sometimes called intrinsic asthma or non-atopic asthma, um, and it's usually adult um, uh, onset uh, more than uh, it is present. It, it is present more, uh, in uh, adults more than in uh, kids. Uh, it's sensitive to aspirin. It's called aspirin-sensitive asthma. I'll talk about that also separately, and it tends to be uh, more severe, unfortunately. Um, the finding that an asthmatic is a topic does not always imply that the disease is allergic in nature or that atopy is causing asthma, right? So there is a high prevalence of atopy among patients without asthma and a large percentage of skin prick sensitive persons who have positive skin prick test, they report no allergic symptoms at all. So um, you have to keep that in mind. Um, asthmatic symptoms often improve when the allergen is removed and that's why we try to make some effort to see if the patient is having any uh, allergens or not but it doesn't always it's not always the case and sometimes rigorous allergens uh, avoidance um, yeah, has not uh, shown any evidence of decreasing the risk of developing asthma but it's still um, the physician should still make an effort to try to uh, see if uh, his patient is uh, his or her patient is having any uh, atopy or specific allergens So we talked about the uh, allergens uh, being common triggers for exacerbations. Um, and these are just kind of uh, briefly mentioning some of them. But uh, viral infection uh, might be probably the most common trigger, uh, especially after respiratory tract infection, um, like rhinovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, influenza, parainfluenza virus, coronavirus. Um, and the uh, usually um, associated with acute severe exacerbations of asthma. Now, some bacterial infections like mycoplasma and chlamydia also might be associated with exacerbation, but viral infections are uh, much more common. Uh, drugs, uh, you need to ask about you know history of drugs, especially aspirin or non-selective COX-2 inhibitors, uh, beta, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors in some reports as well. Um, and uh, in one, uh, Cochrane review talking about beta blockers, they, f um, they found that cat selective beta blockers uh, do not appear to produce clinically significant adverse uh, respiratory effects in mild to moderate asthma. So it could be an, uh, still could be an option in some patients who need beta, block beta blockers. Uh, exercise induced asthma also is a very known entity. We'll talk about that in a separate slide. Uh, physical factors like cold air and hyperventilation can also trigger asthma, laughter as well, hot weather and when the weather changes, uh, like thunderstorm asthma when they're like storm or acute change in the weather, sometimes that might be associated with asthma, exposure to uh, strong smells or perfumes as well. And food, um, although the association is kind of weak, um, and exclusion, exc uh, exclusion of diets are usually unsuccessful at uh, reducing the frequency of episodes. Uh, but it's still some food additives uh, might also trigger some uh, asthma. But again, the association is relatively weak. Uh, air pollution, uh, like the presence of sulfur dioxide, ozone, or nitrogen oxides. So, you know, cities with some air pollution, uh, you know, some uh, asthma patients, they might not do well in these places. Uh, occupational asthma, also we'll talk about that. 
uh, hormonal factors uh, some uh, ladies might get uh, asthma more to, to before the menstruation is called pre-menstrual asthma uh, thyroid uh, dysfunction also can be associated with worsening asthma so you might need to consider that in some patients GERD, uh, we talked about the non-association with asthma and also uh, stress, any uh, physical or emotional stress sometimes can also trigger uh, asthma.